Bitcoin. This digital money first became widely used on the dark web, the underground internet markets selling drugs and sex. But now Microsoft accepts Bitcoin in the Windows and Xbox stores, and big banks are adapting some of its technology. This is not a way to pay for coffee. This is not a great way for an American to pay for something on the internet. But it turns out that there are a lot of other things that people are looking to do with digital money. Bitcoin started as the vision of idealists and libertarians, but reality has intruded. Oh, did I mention one of my coworkers knows someone who invested in digital currency and has made a fortune? There's so much I have to learn each day in preparation for interviews that when I don't absolutely have to know something, I sometimes give myself permission not to learn about it. And that's been my attitude toward Bitcoin until now. Or to put it another way, when both Bjork and Microsoft are accepting Bitcoin, it's time. So we're going to talk about what Bitcoin is and how it's used in the underground and legit marketplaces, how it's become a vehicle for investors, and how big banks are starting to copy it. So for those of us who have never used Bitcoin and don't really understand how it works, you tell me, why should we care? Well, I think that there are a number of layers on which this uh, Bitcoin thing is, is interesting. I mean, on, on the most sort of immediate level, people are using Bitcoin in, in really interesting ways. I think people are using it as a sort of black market currency to buy drugs and make ransom payments. And it is allowing for essentially new types of crime. But I think it also is pointing in the direction of where money might be going. And, and, it, and I think it tells us something about what money is. Um, and, and then, you know, to, to zoom out even more broadly, I think it's really interesting because it's not just a new kind of software or a new kind of money. It is essentially a social movement. Um, you know, it's, it has taken off because it has won over thousands, tens of thousands, millions of people around the world. And I think it's really interesting to think about. Well, um, if you were to buy all of the Bitcoin out in the world right now at the price this week, um, you would pay something like $120 billion. So that's the sort of simple way of thinking about the size of the Bitcoin economy. That, that is, just for comparison's sake, uh, larger than the value of Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley, larger than the value of PayPal. So uh, that value um, is stored in something like 17 million Bitcoins that are distributed around the world. Okay, so what is a Bitcoin? Well, to start with, um, and I think the thing that probably most people are aware of, it's essentially a digital token that you can buy and sell. Um, but I think one of the reasons Bitcoin has remained so confusing to people is that it's that digital token, but then it's also the network on which it lives. And it's, it's really the network that makes it so different. And so we refer to Bitcoin, we refer to that network as um, essentially the Bitcoin network. And it's something more like the internet. It's a decentralized network of computers around the world where all of these Bitcoin live. Ah, how is this decentralized when it is attached to the dollar by way of valuation? So was it created to solve certain problems with money as we know it? Uh, yes. I mean, this this idea, when it first emerged um, in, in late 2008, actually on Halloween of 2008, um, was the culmination of really decades of work um, among a sort of small group of computer scientists and activists um, who were worried about, th th their biggest concern was around privacy. Um, they were really worried that, you know, in the existing system, when money became digital, so when, when we started to be able to move money around on computers with credit cards, every transaction that you made was tracked and could later be monitored by the government or by big companies. And not to mention the financial industrial complex including the banks as well as those companies 
that were also mentioned at the beginning of the show. And so, you know, a big part of the work that went into this was to essentially create um, an anonymous digital cache. Um, and so that was, that was one strain of thinking that went into this. But the other big strain when this came out was that this was essentially two months after Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. Um, so right in the heart of the financial crisis. And there was a lot of distrust of both Wall Street and the big banks, um, but also of central banks. And here, uh, this was introduced as a new form of money that it could exist independent of all of these institutions that people were so skeptical of. So the people who created Bitcoin, as it grew out of a movement, wanted privacy. but if I'm not sure exactly where the line is between privacy and secrecy, but there's been a lot of secrecy surrounding the use of Bitcoin because the first place it really took off was the underground market, like on the dark web, the black markets on the dark web selling drugs and sex, right? Right, for sure. I mean, the line between privacy and, and secrecy is always very, very fuzzy. And I think that a lot of the technologies that are out there to provide privacy are also sort of abused on the other side from people wanting to do things um, that they don't want the government to be watching. And so, so yes, I mean, Bitcoin sort of came out of this idealistic impulse. And, you know, after it was announced by the, the creator of Bitcoin, this, this character known as Satoshi Nakamoto, it sort of stumbled along for two years. And, you know, you could, you could send Bitcoin around, um, but they really weren't worth anything at, at that point. And it really kind of gained its first reason for being with the creation of the Silk Road, which was this, you know, online black market uh, sort of eBay where you could buy drugs. And it, the Silk Road, the, the creator of the Silk Road realized that Bitcoin made this possible for the first time. It was, it was frankly, quite hard to buy drugs online um, before this, because if you did, uh, the police would just go ask PayPal or Visa, uh, you know, who had sent this money to buy this uh, baggie of uh, heroin or, or marijuana, and PayPal would uh, give those records over and the person would get arrested. With, with Bitcoin, you could send that money and nobody would know where the money came from. And that sort of gave rise to this whole new online market. And it's the same phenomenon with ransomware, when somebody's computer is basically being held hostage by malware, and the only way to get access to your computer back is to pay the designated amount of ransom money in Bitcoin. But of course, experts warn that even if you pay it, you might not necessarily get access to yeah. your computer again. But yeah. um, So that's something that's caught on. Yeah, I mean, that's been a, a big thing that's risen up in the last two years. And, um, you and, know, and as you say, that, that, that applies not just individual computers, but also to like whole networks and to hospitals and, you know, around, yeah. around the globe. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's created enormous problems uh, for, for companies, for governments. Um, you've seen, yeah, hospitals that have had to just go back to analog record keeping for weeks. Um, I, I think it was the San Francisco Chronicle, or maybe it was uh, a radio station here that basically had to stop using computers because their computers were, uh, were, were all frozen by a ransomware attack. And, and ransomware was really something that, it, it existed before Bitcoin, but you know, in, in tech speak, it didn't scale without Bitcoin. Before, somebody would have to go get a money order and send it around the world physically. That, that's not an easy thing to do. With, with Bitcoin, you can now uh, send you know, $500 to the, the captor of your files in Ukraine or Russia, and the transaction is done in 20 minutes. And you know, that, that it is possible because of this new way that Bitcoin works, which um, you know, the, the first sort of uh, real world uses of that have, have not been altogether uh, positive ones for the world, I think. In terms of the dark web and the illegal, you know, the, the markets for illegal goods on the dark web that you have to pay for with Bitcoin, some of those sites have been shut down, including Silk Road, the one that you mentioned. Yeah. And more legit uses of Bitcoin are emerging now. So what are some examples of that? 
Well, the idealism that fueled Bitcoin at the beginning, um, the place where you've seen that playing out is in countries where people have uh, have their money trapped or, or are losing money because uh, because the local currency is uh, you know is experiencing hyperinflation and so people are losing all of their savings and looking somewhere somewhere outside of the government's control to put money and so um, you've seen that in countries like Venezuela and Argentina you even hear about it in Zimbabwe um, you know in those places people have always clamored. Uh, to exchange their local currency for dollars because dollars were so much more reliable. But there was, you know, a real shortage of dollars, and when you got the dollars, you frequently had to sort of put them under your mattress, which wasn't terribly secure. You know, the vision with Bitcoin is that in those sorts of places, you can now trade your local currency for Bitcoin and have a somewhat more stable place to keep your money uh, than, you know, the, the, the Bolivar or the Argentine peso. So that, that's sort of, I think, one place where that people like to talk about, talk up, Bitcoin uh, aficionados like to talk up. I mean, it's also very easy to sort of move money around the globe. So, you know, it takes a long time right now to make a sort of pretty basic bank transfer to India, to China, you know, that can take weeks and, you know, require sort of fees at every step along the way. The idea with Bitcoin is, you know, you, you can send it right now you, and, and it's there in essentially 10 minutes. Um, and the person can, can log in and they don't have to get approval from anybody. You know, that's, that's particularly attractive in countries where it's hard for people to get bank accounts and where, you know, places like uh, India, again, where, or, or Africa, where people are sort of locked out of the online economy because they can't get a credit card, they can't get a debit card. Um, you know, they can't sign up for Netflix. Now you can sign up for Netflix very easily uh, in, in India or Africa, even if you don't have uh, a credit card, thanks to Bitcoin. So I'm not sure we know who invented money, but we do know who invented Bitcoin, except we don't know because... <laughs> <laughs> because That's a good way to it. it. Yeah, it's a, it's a pseudonym. He never really yeah. revealed who he was. Even you yeah. have been covering this for, for years, don't know who he is. Right. Oh, I, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah I, I don't even know, is he he, right? I was going to say that. So people frequently say he, she, they, or it, in case it is a sort of autonomous, you know, being that, that created <laughs> this of some sort. Um, but what, you know, what we do know is that the person who first introduced this back in, in 2008 and then released the first software a few months later, uh, went by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto and communicated essentially only by email, um, would, would get on sort of chats uh, and, and, and sort of social media forums, um, but always under that Satoshi Nakamoto pseudonym. Um, and uh, a few years into Bitcoin's existence, right as it was beginning to take off, Satoshi essentially signed off and disappeared, you know, sent the last email, um, gave control of the system over to the people who um, had been drawn to it and were, you know, working on the software at that point. Um, and, and since then, there's been a sort of uh, manhunt for, you know, to, to discover the, the, the true identity of Satoshi Nakamoto. And a bunch of names have been floated over time. Um, I wrote a story when my book came out about the person who, one of the people who is widely viewed as the most likely candidate. Um, but um, all of the people who have been, you know, fingered as potential Satoshi Nakamoto's have denied essentially that they are. Except for, I should say, one person who claimed to be Satoshi Nakamoto and won over a certain number of people. This, this got a lot of news, I think, maybe a year or two back. Um, this guy named Craig Wright from Australia who claimed that he was Satoshi, but as people looked into it and looked into the sort of electronic records, it was, it was quite a chase. Uh, I think most people concluded that this was not, in fact, Satoshi Nakamoto. So when Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever that is, um, started uh, Bitcoin, he or she issued something between like guidelines and a manifesto, like a nine-page document. Can you sum up for those of us who don't really understand this? <laughs> the yeah. principles that were laid out in those nine pages Sure. 
Um, yeah, so this was the, the original, it's called Satoshi's White Paper. You know, it has this sort of iconic status, this nine page PDF that was released in, early, in late 2008. Um, and it sort of described how this system was going to work. Um, and it said it would be a sort of electronic cash um, and uh, there were going to be certain rules that would govern this electronic cash. Um, there would only ever be 21 million Bitcoins created. That rule was sort of stated there at the beginning. And that was created so they would have a sort of scarcity like gold, and, and which, which might lead people to think there was going to be value in it. If there wasn't going to be an unlimited number of them, that might confer a certain value on Bitcoin, which it has ended up doing. Um, so that, that was one rule. Um, the, the other rules were about how Bitcoin would be distributed. Um, it's not, there wasn't going to be a bank of Bitcoin that would distribute them to everybody. They were going to be sort of slowly dripped out over time to people who joined the network. Um, and I think that's, that's the, the most important thing about the rules around Bitcoin was that it was going to be a network of computers, sort of like the internet, that anybody could join. Um, and anybody could support this, and that would allow for Bitcoin to exist independent of any sort of central source of authority. There wasn't going to be a government here, there wasn't going to be a company, there was going to be this network of computers that was supporting it. And that means that anybody can join that network and send money to anybody else. Um, and so those were sort of the, the, the basic rules that were, were laid down. Um, and I should say that in the first months after this was proposed, uh, this was not a rousing success. There were, you know, a, a handful of people, you know, maybe eight people who, who, who responded to this idea, most of whom thought that there was no way that it could work. Well, for this to work, it really requires a level of faith. When you're talking about, say, dollars, it's backed up by the U.S. government. And if you have money in a bank, a certain amount of it is backed up by the FDIC. Um, yeah. You know, if you invest in the stock market, it's going to fluctuate, but you have shares in something. Um, whereas with Bitcoin, it, it just seems like an act of faith in Bitcoin. Well, you, you are certainly right. I, I, should, I, should, uh, I should note, I think, that um, you know, all of those instances you just mentioned, the U.S. dollar is backed up by the U.S. government, um, by the FDIC. Um, that's, that's true. Uh, I mean, if you kind of dig a little deeper, um, you know, what you're expressing faith in when you express faith in the dollar is essentially the U.S. government and the FDIC. You're, you're, you're believing that those are going to be around. Um, and obviously that's, that's not it may be a hard thing to believe in, but there's some chance that it won't happen. And certainly there are countries where uh, the government has issued uh, currency and then the government has fallen and the, and the currency has turned out to be worthless. Um, so to a degree, money is always about faith. It's about believing that the thing you're holding in your hand is going to be worth something tomorrow, next week, in a month, and that somebody will take it and give you something in exchange. Um, the, the same is true with Bitcoin, um, and certainly there are not the institutions backing it up uh, that you have for the U.S. dollar or for uh, stocks. Um, but now Microsoft accepts Bitcoin in the Windows and Xbox stores, and big banks are adapting some of its technology. Um, but what is backing it up is this network. Um, and so you, in essence, are sort of expressing your faith in that network and the power of the network and the power of the rules behind Bitcoin to uh, draw people to this currency and to make people think that the network, you know, may outlive the U.S. government. I, 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 I wouldn't argue that myself. I, I don't know the odds. I would say probably the odds of the U.S. government outlasting the Bitcoin network are, are good. But um, I, I think that a lot of people uh, have had assumed that Bitcoin, that the Bitcoin network wouldn't survive to, uh, you know, through the first year, much less the first eight years, which which it's done, um, and it's sort of continued to kind of engender this faith among the people who uh, who who believe in it, who follow it. Bitcoin, the digital currency that was created in 2008. 
Although its roots were in idealism and libertarianism, it first became widely used for purchases on the dark web, the sites on the internet black market selling drugs and sex. But this digital currency is now being used for more mainstream purchases. Big banks are starting to find uses for some of the innovative structure of the Bitcoin system. Um, and certainly there are not the institutions backing it up uh, that you have for the US dollar or for uh, stocks. Digital gold. Uh, New Bitcoin is mine. So um, would you just tell us a little bit? It's a dangerous question and it's, it's a hard one to answer simply, but um, you know, the answer to how Bitcoin are created does sort of give you some glimpse into the inner workings of how this thing functions and why it has survived as long as it has. I mean, essentially, Bitcoin released onto the network every 10 minutes. A new block of Bitcoin is released onto the network every 10 minutes. And this started on the very first day. On the very first day, there was zero Bitcoin in the world. And after 10 minutes, uh, after about 10 minutes, uh, after about 10 minutes, 50 Bitcoin were released to one of the computers that was hooked into the network, which at that point was Satoshi Nakamoto's computers. They were uh, uh, almost the only computers that were hooked in at that point. But the rules of Bitcoin, the, the software, determine how those Bitcoins, those new Bitcoins being released, are going to be distributed to people. And the first thing that this does is that it encourages people to join the network. You can essentially, at least early on, you can essentially get free Bitcoin if you join the network. And so it incentivized people to join the network. The other thing it did was that it got those computers to start keeping the records for the network. So if you want to win those Bitcoins, essentially you have to start working as an accountant for the network and registering all the new transactions that come in. And if you are doing that, it, the more computers you add to help you know, serve as an accountant for the network, the better chance you have of winning Bitcoins. And so that is how sort of the records are kept. And that's how you get people to volunteer to keep the records. You give them new Bitcoins. You offer these new Bitcoins. So over time, that incentive system has generated this enormous network. Uh, right now, there's something like 13,000 nodes or computers hooked into the network that are helping to keep these records. And, and a lot of those are mining, trying to win these new Bitcoins. And so this complicated economic system was set up with lots of incentives in there to get people to participate and to sort of create the foundation for this decentralized network to, to keep all the records. Yeah. Uh, and, and, who decides you know, who we're, wins? We're, we're, we're slipping down the rabbit hole here. And yeah, uh, that's what I was let's afraid make of. Sure not to go, yeah. uh, let's make sure not to go too deep down it because it, it's based on cryptography and mm -hmm. encryption, which is sort of the leading edge of math, you know, basically really hard math problems you have to solve. But at the most basic, computers are trying to process all the transactions coming into the Bitcoin network as quickly as possible. And the faster you do it, the more efficiently you do it, the better chance you have of winning Bitcoin. There's, a, there's an element of luck in it. It's somewhat like a lottery, but essentially the person with the most computing power has the best chance of winning the lottery. And so what's that, what that's created today is a world in which you have literally server farms in outer, inner Mongolia, in Tibet, in Iceland, anywhere where you can get cheap electricity to run computers very fast. People have set up basically server farms, big you know, buildings just filled with computers trying to sort of unlock these new Bitcoins, um, but also sort of serving as the backbone of this network and 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 you know the more the more computers you have joined in the more secure the network is the harder it is to attack and it's this crazy world in which i mean literally in china which has become one of the most uh, you know one of the places where you have the most bitcoin mining you know spread all around china and you have next to you know, next to hydroelectric dams and next to coal plants, people have, have set up these server farms that are dedicated to doing nothing but mining Bitcoin. I mean, there are literally sort of towns that are built around this in China where you have people just living 
in the Bitcoin mining facility. You know, Chinese people who really, you know, the people who are working there are, are sort of the custodians. They, most of them have no idea really what's going on or how the system works. But it's, you know, it's created this whole economy. Uh, I, I mean, a, a Bitcoin uh, this week is worth something like $7,500. Um, you know, a year ago it was worth less than a thousand dollars, and that has attracted a whole bunch of new people to this. Um, it's, I, I mean, a, a Bitcoin uh, this week is worth something like $7,500. Um, you know, a year ago it was worth less than a thousand dollars, and that has attracted a whole bunch of new people to this, um, attracted people around the world. And here, what you've seen is a lot of hedge funds getting into this game. So there are now um, hedge funds being set up, something like 100 hedge funds in the last year have been set up to invest exclusively in virtual currencies, Bitcoin, as well as some of the competitors that have, have sprung up. I, I mean, if you look at the, the chart of the Bitcoin price since it was born, it is just a series of spikes and then drops, and then spikes and then drops. And over time, you know, you get the spike and it drops down to a level that is generally still higher than where it was before the spike, but lower than the spike. And so I think a lot of people are asking right now how long this can go on. And certainly, uh, you've heard you've heard numerous uh, CEOs of banks say this is unsustainable. This is a bubble. This is going to crash. Um, and I think there's 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 no doubt that there probably is going to be some reckoning here. I mean, this meets many of the definitions of a bubble. People are speculating on the future value and desire for Bitcoin. People are are speculating that this will serve more purposes in the future and will be more valuable to more people in the future than it is today. And they're, they're betting, a lot of people are just betting that the price is going to go up without knowing anything about it. And, and those are a lot of the characteristics that you see uh, in bubbles. I, I mean, you know, the, the, the counter argument is that this is uh, the first time that we've had a scarce digital resource. So I think the internet until now, most things on the internet, you can copy and paste, right? That's what the music industry found. You can copy and paste an MP3, you can copy and paste a movie file. Things aren't scarce on the internet. And one of the things that Bitcoin did through this weird, complicated system of incentives is it created a scarce digital asset for the first time. So a lot of people think about this now as something like digital gold. You know, this is a place where you can keep your money because there's only going to be so many of them and the system works and it's it's in some ways better than gold because, you know, gold you can't carry across a border secretly. You can't, you can try to stuff it in your underwear, but you know, gold people can, uh, it, it's hard to travel with gold. Bitcoin, uh, as long as you have that password, you can go somewhere else with internet access and you have access to your money. So that's the sort of thesis on this, but um, I think that the sort of expectations and the types of people who are getting into this right now, uh, a lot of them are not terribly sophisticated. I think the blockchain, in the simplest sense, is the record of all the Bitcoin transactions. It's a, it's a ledger, sort of a spreadsheet, on which Bitcoin transactions are recorded. Um, but what's special about the Bitcoin ledger, the Bitcoin blockchain, is that it's not kept by a central institution. It's kept by a bunch of people, um, and part of the idea is that it's a bunch of people who don't trust each other but can use this system to have a sort of shared record of their assets. Um, and so this blockchain idea, this idea of keeping records in a decentralized way so that anybody can consult it um, and, 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 and that nobody is in charge, that idea of the blockchain is, is something that's piqued a lot of interest um, in the financial industry, but also um, in a whole bunch of other industries. IBM has made this one of their biggest uh, pushes over the last few years to kind of try to regain relevance. 
they have made a big move into uh, into the blockchain industry, as has um, Microsoft, and they're essentially making a bet that this is a new way to track information. And you know, we live in an information economy, and so if you can come up with new ways to track and store information more reliably, it, it has the potential to recreate some of the foundations of the information economy. It, it really sounds, sounds rather big. You know, when you just look at something like the financial industry, the banks are looking at this as, you know, maybe instead of paying the New York Stock Exchange to buy and sell stocks there and then transfer the money for us and move the stocks back and forth and make sure all the records are kept, maybe we, all the banks, we can just set up a blockchain where we can all trade and we don't have to pay anybody in the middle. And we can keep track of all those records and all of us can do it without trusting any any of the other people in the system. And that's the sort of basic idea that I think has given rise to this whole new industry. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm in there on a daily basis trying to understand how these things work, how you move between different currencies, how it can move around the world, and that's been a, an important part of reporting on this. So if you want to get Bitcoin to make purchases, Mm-hmm. How do you get it? Well, companies, not, not surprisingly, uh, companies have sprung up to make this very easy for you to, to take your money and give you Bitcoin. You know, there's probably the biggest company in the United States is a company called Coinbase, which is essentially a sort of Charles Schwab or an e-trade for Bitcoin. You send them money and then you can trade on their platform. You can move in and out of Bitcoin and then you can take your money out and transfer it back to your bank. And they've made it very easy so that anybody, you know, so it's as easy as, probably easier than buying a stock is through E-Trade. And and part of what's interesting there, I guess that's not too surprising. What's interesting is that the government and regulators have essentially allowed this to happen, have said, this is okay. New York, the state of New York has, has created a bit license that Coinbase has and that makes it easier for them to do this and easier to get bank accounts. And so, at least in the United States, the government has sort of said, we're going to let this happen. We realize there might be something of value here, so we're not going to try to kill this. And that's why I was drawn to it. I mean, the number of people who have gone to jail, often shortly after getting fabulously wealthy, is incredible. And so a lot of the stories I talk tell in my book are these stories of these astronomic rises followed by these incredible falls. And um, it'll sort of keep going down until it approaches zero. And there are major banks and even the New York Stock Exchange you know, that are picking up on some of the architecture to borrow it for their own purposes.